Tonight, I want to teach from the subject, the offer of two kings. Amen. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem. Both kings went out to meet Abram. Neither went out empty-handed. Both leaders made Abram an offer. Two kings, two offers, two very different responses to the kings, two very different responses to their offer, two kings who totally contrast each other. What they both had in common was they both uh, had an encounter with Abram. And so I want to talk about this tonight, and I believe it's going to bless us real good. Bless us as we study tonight, Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Abram's response, and uh, I really want you to uh, get this, was based on his relationship that he had with the most high. It was not based on his response, a relationship that he had to cultivate, but it was based on his pre-existing relationship with the most high God. And I'll tell you something, every one of us are going to respond to everything that life throws our way based on our relationship with the Most High. Amen. Amen. That, that is what dictates the way we respond to things, our relationship with the Most High. Well, I didn't bring God in it when I responded. That is your relationship with the Most High. Your relationship is you ignore him. Let's see. He says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. Okay? So there is no getting around our responses uh, to life's circumstances. There's no getting around that when we respond, our response is based on our relationship with the Most High. Amen. So... Um, I want, to, I want to talk about it tonight. Both offers came uh, in our text to Abram uh, at a point in his life that was a high point. point. He, was, he was, Pastor Jones, he was on cloud 15 when these uh, kings came out to see him. And his response to both offers was as a result of, as I said, I'll say it again, his relationship with the Lord. Amen. He didn't have to pray. He didn't have to seek God. He responded quickly to both men. So let's look at this. Let's study this particular passage tonight. I want you to go to verse 1. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see, we're going to study what is called the Battle of Catalemor. Catalemor was a suzerain, and a suzerain is the leader of a country who has such power and influence that he leads, he has influence over other countries, and other countries responds to them as though those countries are states in his country. See, we make up the, uh, we live in the United States of America. There is the federal government, and then there is, there are these United States which form the federal government. And uh, states' laws 
are supposed to, in certain categories, trump federal law. And in some things, federal law trumps state laws. The president of the United States, any president, he holds a federal office, but he governs from the, that office uh, uh, with the help of the uh, legislative branch and the judi judicial branch. The president is the head of the executive branch. They govern and rule the United States of America. We're not, we don't have the power over the country of Mexico like the government has influence and power over the state of North Carolina. But when you deal with a suzerain, a suzerain has influence over a country. That kind of influence, uh, like a president would have over a state. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah. So the, the, we're going to see what happened was that some of the countries that the suzerain, uh, Catalemor, had influence over, finally got tired of paying taxes to him and being under his reign, and they have decided to fight. Yeah. And what was at stake was uh, what Catalemor wanted. Uh, there was a trade route called the King's Highway. And uh, this was a major trade route. And one of the things that would, it would give him, would help him with, is whenever the soldiers got ready to, to go down to Egypt and to travel further south, if you control that route, you also control the way to get food to, the, to them, to get commerce to them. It was, a, it was a power move. And in this power move, the man of God, Abram, ends up getting pulled into it. It, it, it literally had nothing to do with him. And where he was living was not affected by the battle of the suzerain, uh, Catalemo, but it pulled him in because of his nephew, Lot. Sometimes the behavior of others pulls you into things that you, you normally would not be a part of. So verse 1 says, And it came to pass in the days of uh, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elis Elisar, and Catalemar, king of Elam, and Tebel, king of nations. Now on Catalemar's team, there was four uh, nations. You see that? Verse 2 says, that these made war with, with Bera, king of Sodom, and Bersha, king of Gomorrah, and Shibna, king of Adam, Adma, excuse me, and Shabima, Shamiber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zor. So this four kings went to war with five. All right? Now, all these were joined together in the vale of Siddim, which is the Salt Sea. So the five collected themselves in the vale, the, uh, the valley of Siddim, near the Salt Sea, which is, of course, the Salt Sea, is also the Dead Sea. All right? Now, this is the, the Dead Sea, uh, the geographics of the Dead Sea at this point was different than the way the Dead Sea is now or even different than the way the Dead Sea would grow to be, would become after Genesis chapter 19. Because what God did uh, is that he rained fire and brimstone down from heaven and he pummeled Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about. The, 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 the storm was so powerful that it changed the geographics and it enlarged the Dead Sea. 
And uh, there, were, there were people who, who one time questioned the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what happened was technology caught up and people began to find the archaeologists and others began to find the artifacts, because people wonder, where is Sodom and Gomorrah? This is a made up story. There's nothing here but the Dead Sea. That's because it was driven underneath. God drove it in the ground, and they've discovered artifacts and all kinds of stuff, uh, things that supports the biblical account that there was uh, the city of Sodom, there was Gomorrah, and when the Bible speaks of God raining down fire and brimstone from heaven, that is, God sent a powerful thunderstorm. Yes, sir. You talk, you know, we're praying for, uh, what is it, Missouri, and, and areas that have been hit of late. And, and we're in that season again, and, and all we can do is pray, God help us all. And, uh, and, 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 and when you read about what God can do through Mother Nature, what God can do, uh, actually you see that even our worst storms haven't been as bad as what God can do. Ask Noah. He let it rain. 40 days and 40 nights. But worse than the rain, God, God released the fountains of the earth and water began to spring out from the ground. And it caused a flash flood. And that, that's what wiped out everything uh, and everybody so quickly. And on top of that, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. We serve a mighty God. And, uh, and, and we ought to thank the Lord, ought to, we ought to thank him uh, for how he, uh, he's merciful to us. He's merciful, That's, he, he's merciful. So uh, these uh, five gathered, and, uh, and, and, and look at this, verse 4 says, 12 years they served Catalemor. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. They said, we're tired of paying tax to Catalemor. We're tired of, uh, 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 of the tariffs. <laughs> what the Bible is so. <laughs> it's amazing. You read the Bible. Uh, you, the Bible covers everything. And, and so you turn on the news and you see things going on. You say, man, I've never seen it like this. Then you open, open the Bible and find out, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> things happen. And so these nations, these five nations said, you know what? We're, 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 we're tired. We're tired of this. And we're not going to put up with it anymore. And in the 14th, uh, in the 12th, at verse 4, 12 years they served him, and in the 13th year they rebelled. They stopped paying. So what Catalemor did was he decided to make his move. And it was a very, very, very clever, uh, circuitous move. He decided, now look at verse 5, and in the 14th year, a year after they stopped paying, right, right. see, he went on the move, and when I speak of Catalemor, him and the three kings that fought with him, uh, the kings that were with him and smote the Rephidims in Ashtoreth, Carnaim, and... Uh, the Susans in Ham and the Imams in Shavia Karatham and the Hortrites in their Mount Seir and El Paran which is by the wilderness. I don't know why these places couldn't be called <laughs> it's regular names. But anyway so, they, what he did, I mean, you know, I'm with you, John. I don't know why they just call him Zebulun, uh, Apex, Carrie, you know, just. <laughs> but man, I tell you. So, but what he did was he, he did not go directly to war with uh, uh, the king of Sodom, with Berah and his four 
uh, nations who rose up against them. Instead uh, of directly attacking the five cities, uh, he that were rebelling against him, he went against, he took a different approach and uh, 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 he went down and around. I'm, I'm describing the, the approach. What he did was he cut off, he conquered all of the nations that could possibly give support to the five that he was about to conquer. So before he would conquer them, he cut off, he cut off their pipelines. Anybody who could possibly give them any help, all of a sudden now they're all his. It's like major companies when they just can't, when they just can't compete with uh, with a comp with the, with their competition. You know what they often do? They just buy them out. All of a sudden now, uh, this company owns that company. They were, the two telephone companies, they were battling, they were battling, and uh, they were battling out. So one said, you know what, there's no point in me battling. I'm going to buy you out. And sometimes it's a hostile takeover. So now, now the, 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 the five that had gathered themselves and felt like they were in a position of, of strength, all of a sudden now, uh, they're cut off. They're cut off because of the route that uh, Catalema took. He came sweeping down the western hills towards Sodom and the other cities. This approach of the this approach of the coalition nations it puzzles some because of where the Dead Sea is today. But they 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 didn't understand that the the geographics were much different then than they are now. Catalemar could not mount an immediate military response to the region, regional rebellion, but having assembled a coalition of kings by the following spring, he led troops southward down the king's highway to subjugate the rebellious states. And so once he had subjugated them, he then made war against them. Verse 8 says, And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zabim, Zobim, uh, Zeboam, excuse me, and the king of Bela, the same as Zor, and they joined battle with them in the vale of Sedim, with Catalemar, king of Elam, and with Tabel, king of Nation, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arak, king of Elisar, four kings against five. Now, you would think that Sodom and their coalition would have still won because for one thing is it, they had five nations. So their, their delegation was larger. So you got four against five. Plus you're going to see that the location was one that Sodom and their coalition, they knew that area better. So they had home field a home court advantage. And they had plenty of, of uh, material to fight with. So let's, let's look at this. All right, verse 10 says, And the valley, the veil of Siddim, was full of slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, look at this, this the battle just started, we find them already running, <laughs> fled and fell there. While running, they tumbled over and fell into the slime pits. And they that remain fled to the mountains. Uh, I wrote, I, I quoted uh, from uh, John G. Butler. He said this. He said this was a 
pitiful defense. They put up a pitiful fight. They, they, it's, listen, the battle was over before it even started. Because, you know, one of the things that Ezekiel tells us was that one of the sins of Sodom was that they was, it was idleness of bread. They were, they, they didn't train. They had, they were, it was a luxurious place. Now, filled with homosexuals, uh, filled with lesbians, but, but filled with luxury, idleness of bread. They were filled with pride. People like that don't make good soldiers. So when it's time to fight, they really couldn't put up a fight. This is, this is why the, the, uh, the shut-in is so important. You don't want to be a lazy believer. You want, you want to get your spiritual senses sharpened because fights are coming. Amen. And as a believer, you got to know how to stand your ground and fight. I'm not talking about a fist fight, but I'm talking about these spiritual battles, things that are, there are, there are things shifting in the heavenlies that where the enemy has his eyes on you and he has his eyes on me. He has his eyes on all believers. So when these people began to fight, it was a terrible fight. It was a pitiful defense. And look at this. Verse 11 says, and they took all the goods. See, they had supplies. They ran and left their supplies. They took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the victuals. Look at this. And went their way. Catalemor, they conquered as the men of, of, of Sodom and in that group ran. Then they took their goods and uh, uh, their, their booty. They left everything that they left on the field and their people. Verse 12 says, and they took Lot, Abram's brother. This is why you have to pray before you make a move. That's why you have to pray. Because if you back up, if you just back up to, to, to chapter 13, the Bible teaches, and verse 10 says, And Lot lifted his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. Uh, look at this. It was so beautiful. Uh, like the land of Egypt, as thou cometh to Zohar, it was beautiful. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from another. It didn't say that Lot prayed and asked God, where should he go? Lot didn't pray. He didn't get direction from the Lord. Moved down to Sodom, set up in Sodom, became, was very wealthy, very successful, but he went to a place that was already in trouble. And so, uh, 12 years later or so, we find now that he is captured. His money is gone. His, 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 his prestige is gone. Everything is, is interrupted now because uh, Sodom have been conquered. And the mighty Catalemor uh, and his four, his three kings, they have conquered the land. And look at this. And verse 13 says, and there came one that had escaped and told Abram, the Hebrew, for he uh, dwelled in the, in the plain of memory, the Amorite, brother of Eskol. And look at this, and brother of Anah, and these were confederate with Abram. So Abram is about 17 miles west of the Dead Sea. He has nothing to do with this. One of the people from Sodom escaped, and they ran and told Abram what happened to his nephew. All right. Are you following me? Verse 14 says, And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 313. Now, when Abram got the word that Lot had been captured, Abram did something that, would, that you know what? It amounts to Jesus saying, look, uh, we've got, uh, we got 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. If I send them away, I'm sending them away fasting. 
They're not going to be able to make it. We got to feed them. Somebody trying to be smart says, uh, well, a lad brought his lunch. But what is this among so many? See, if all you got, Abram had no army. Abram had slaves. Abram had servants. Abram was not a king over a nation. He was God's man, but he was not a king. He did not have an army. Catalemar was a king. Bera was a king. These were nations fighting. Abram is a private citizen, but he was a blessed man. And look at this. This blessed man organizes 318 slaves, servants, to go and fight Catalemar, the mighty suzerain who had just conquered a coalition of five nations. Right. Tell you what it tells you, that with God, all things are possible to him that believes. With God. With God. So, you, so, I mean, he don't stand a chance. Now, the, the, the odds are stacked against him. But, and, and, you know, we talk about Abram being the father of the faithful and all that. But, you know, we don't talk much about Abram being a fighter. Oh, yeah, he can fight. He can fight. So, you, you, they, they got, and look what he did now. He trained his servants, born in his house, 318 and pursued. They followed them unto Dan. That is, they followed them, some estimates 120, others estimate 140 miles. They pursue Catalemar. Uh, 318 men pursuing this mighty suzerain with four mighty nations, and uh, he's the man. Just and, and he just conquered five nations and, uh, and they loaded down with spoils and yeah. booty, with gold and silver, bread and oh, everything, food, clothing. They conquered the nations. And, uh, and not to mention, not to mention the, uh, the, the vitriol and the joy you have from having just won. See, the, 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 the rah, rah, and that, oh my, you're talking about the, the swish. Uh, you're talking about the, uh, the, these, these were just the winners, right? So he follows them, and then God gives the man of God a plan. He decides to... Uh, make a nighttime strike. Verse 15 says, and he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night and smote them and pursued them. Look at this. Unto Hobah, which was another hundred miles. He took 300, this, 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 it had to be God. He took 318 men at night, see, listen, um, what did the song say? Little becomes much when it's placed in the master's hand. See, see, with, with God, with God, all things are, oh, y'all don't hear me. All things are possible. Amen. He's, we serve a mighty, mighty God. Amen. See, and, and, and listen, I, I, I was just totally, totally impressed with uh, this mighty man of God for being able to take it to uh, these kings. Amen. So he went there, he divided himself, and he hit them. And when he hit them, he made Catalema and his men respond to his hit. The same way Catalemar and his men made the men of Sodom and Gomorrah respond to his hit, his attack. They dropped everything they had and took off running. And guess what they left? They left, the, the, they left everything, including the slaves. 
the prisoners of war, the people they captured, they left them all and they ran for them li- for their lives. They ran over a hundred miles and, and Abram and Abram just, he, he beat them good. Do you see that? So they retreated and, uh, and it was a hasty retreat. It was so hasty that they abandoned their loot. They left the captives. And the Bible says in verse 16, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. Lord have mercy. What a victory. What a mighty man of God. So the, the people of, uh, of, 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 of Sodom, of, of Shinar, uh, of Adma, of uh, Zeboam, of, of Zor, all of these people, they were brought back safe and sound by this Hebrew, God Almighty, and who went to rescue Lot, and the rest of the people got blessed. So, on his way home, get into my text, huh? on his way home, Abram is coming home, and he's feeling good. Because he just won a mighty battle. Tired, you know, they've been uh, to, uh, approximately, in totem, 240 miles. So, uh, see, you know, to, to serve the Lord, you have to have endurance, and you have to be a warrior. See, oh, you, you, if you, listen, you won't make it this thing if you're weak and push over and, and cry, baby. Satan's going to get you. You got to, got to let the Lord toughen you up. Amen. So, now, he's coming home, and on his way home, at a high place in his life, Abram meets two kings. Two kings with two uh, very different offers. You're going to see where Abram acknowledges his his dependence upon one of the kings, and he declares his independence from the other. Amen. Verse 17 says, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, after his return from the slaughter of Catalemar and of the kings that were with him. So he slaughtered Catalemar and the other three kings at the valley of Sheve. And look at this, which is the king's dale. This is uh, uh, the king's dale is where, where, where they met uh, just uh, outside of Jerusalem. So now, the king of Sodom, I guess he didn't die in the slime pit. He fell in it, and he wouldn't come out till the battle was over. (laughs) So the fight's over. Here here he comes. And um, another king shows up who was not in the battle. His nation was not threatened. He had, he seemingly had nothing to do with it, and yet he had everything to do with it. The Bible says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth, that is, he went out to meet Abram, and he brought forth bread and wine. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a minute. All right? He brings bread and wine. Now, we will see that one king, Abram knew that he was inferior to. And to the other king, Abram knew that he was superior to. To the king that he was inferior to, he paid tithe to him. To the king that he was, that Abram was superior to, Abram would have nothing to do with him. Before the king of Salem, Abram, you, we will see, 
that he was humbled and differential. Before the king of Sodom, he was firm and uncompromising. Spiritual insight made him aware of the difference between the two men. You know, we like that. The body of Christ today has no spiritual insight. No spiritual insight. We can't tell the difference between a Bera, king of Sodom, and a Melchizedek, king of Jerusalem. Amen. King of Salem. We see discernment is very important. Look at how saints now, look at look at how saints now are enamored by the world. Praise the Lord. Look at how it's so easy to get uh, Christian singers to sing with the king of Sodom. See, well, you know, this is our business. and the, No, 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 no. This, this was Abraham's business too. Right. Notice how we seem not to have any hesitation. I lost all interest, all interest in them singing shows. I used to like to watch The Voice and all them shows. I lost all, one uh, minister of music from the church, one worship leader, too many. And I saw a bad pattern. I said, you know what? This is not God. Mm -mm, because if they had any discernment, any, that much discernment, it would tell them this is the wrong platform for you. This is how you're going to be a church worship leader. I don't care if they can sing. All worship leaders can sing. It's a singing show. But how are you going to be a church worship leader? and then be on the world stage, and then the world take you and make you sing the worst of the songs. I remember one church worship leader, the, the boy got voted off, they brought him back, and then made him sing an Elton John song. You know what that's all about. And then he lost again. And he didn't know they were making a fool out of him. Felicia Keys uh, backing up, grinding on the preacher. And he got sense enough to know that's the world making a fool out of you. You got to have discernment. Thank you for those three claps. I don't care if you don't clap. I don't care. I can't help it because you can't see no better. Praise the Lord. You like the king of Sodom? No, no, no. I'm not accepting them hand claps. They came late. I don't care. I don't, I don't take them that I got to ask for. Keep it. That's the devil. The devil's making a fool of the saints because we can't tell the difference between Bera, by, my, by the way, the word Bera, the king of Sodom, Bera means son of evil. Catalema means uh, prince of, uh, of Salem, prince of righteousness, king of righteousness. Now, you ought to be able to discern between the son of evil, and a child of God. You ought to have some kind of discernment to, do, to be able to know whether or not an opportunity that's set before you is the Lord opening the door or the devil setting you up for a trap. Discernment ought to be able to tell you whether or not that man is saved, your, your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Discernment ought to be able to tell you. It shouldn't take, it shouldn't take uh, but an hour. Well, I'm dating them. Well, what church does he go to? Well, I'm not quite sure yet. And you're still dating him? You're still dating him? Oh, no. That means, that means you, you, you're not walking in discernment. Because that means you've decided that you're going to pretend that you don't know. All right, marry the joker. After a while, we're going to ask you what church you attended. Because that's a setup of Satan to get you out of God. It was a setup of Satan. Thank God that Abram had discernment. Now notice this. The moment that uh, Melchizedek walks up to him, king of Salem, notice what he did. The Bible says he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the most high God. Now, this Melchizedek was both king and priest. Now, the word Salem, a few years, a little while later, the word Jeru was added to it. 
So Salem is Jerusalem. Praise Lord. So he was the king of Jerusalem. Can I get a witness? Look, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's study uh, and, 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 and look at uh, uh, what, what transpired uh, here. So when he meets um, Melchizedek, notice how he responds to Melchizedek. Notice how humble he is before uh, Melchizedek. Amen. How the, di the difference that he shows um, Melchizedek. All right? Um, let's look at it. Verse um, 18 says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Now let me let me tell you who this Melchizedek was. Would you go to let's the book of Hebrews tells us a little bit about this man. What a mighty king he was. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 7. It says, "For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, prince of the most high God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings." Look at what he did with Abram. He blessed him, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part. I'm going to do a teaching uh, before too long. I've, I want to teach you that, uh, I want to teach you New Testament giving, and uh, when I teach it, I'm going to show you and prove it to you scripturally that a good place to start, a good place to start, a good start, a okay start in New Testament giving is paying your tithe. That's a good place to start. Some of us, it takes, we got to pray fast and seek the Lord just to do that. But in the economy of God, it's a good place to start. That's, I've told you before, tithe is basement giving. You haven't given anything when you tithe. Because the tithe is already holy unto the Lord. That tenth part is not yours. It's a good place to start. So now if you're struggling with, with the start, what does that say about your relationship with the Lord? We have not all of a sudden become a Presbyterian church. <laughs> <sighs> to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all. And, and by the way, when Abram paid tithe to Melchizedek, this was 400 years before Moses came with the law. So when people say, you know, the tithing was a part of the law, no, it antedated, it predated the law by uh, hundreds of years. So when the law was fulfilled in Christ, the, the law fulfilled what the law brought in, but the tithe predated the law. So, and to whom Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being interpreted king of righteousness, Melchizedek, and afterwards, uh, that, uh, and after that also king of Salem, which is, he's the king of peace. Now notice this, without father, without mother, without descent, neither having beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. There was no record of his mom, his dad. There was no record of his genealogy. That's the point that he's making. Now consider how great this man, uh, uh, Melchizedek, consider how great he was unto whom even the patriarch, Abraham gave the tithe, the tenth of, of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have 
a commandment to take tithe of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he, but he whose descent is not counted from them receiveth tithe of Abraham and blessed him that had the promise. When Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham was the one who had the promise because God told him in chapter 15, I'm going to make you the father of all nations. And also in chapter 12. So the promise was on Abram, but Melchizedek was superior to Abram. And Abram paid tithe to him. Verse 8 says, and hear men that die. New Testament when he wrote the book of Hebrews. And hear men that die receive tithe. But there, speaking of Old Testament and Abram and all them, but there he receiveth them of whom it was witness that he liveth. So Abram's response to Melchizedek was one where he realized that someone superior to him was in his presence. Even though he had won this gigantic victory, he still knew that Melchizedek was superior. And so superior that all he wanted from this man of God was a blessing pronounced on him. Amen. And look what look what uh, uh, Melchizedek said. And he said, "Bless." And he blessed him, verse nineteen, and said, "Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and and blessed." be the most high God which have delivered thine enemies to thine hand. And he gave him tithe of all. Look at what, what Melchizedek does. He gives God the credit for Abram's victory. He blesses God for blessing Abram to prevail over his enemies. And he calls the God of the Bible, the God, he calls him the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he says to Abram, it was God who blessed you to win. And, and you know Abram agreed with it because Abram's response was, let me pay you. Let me be a blessing to the Lord. Let me sow a seed. This is before the Levitical law was even set up. This is before there was anything written from Moses that said you tithe to the Levites. And yet the Bible teaches that when Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek, if you go back to Hebrews chapter 7, it teaches also that Levi, who was a descendant of Abraham, paid tithe also, for Levi was in Abraham's loins. This is why parents, this is why parents, women, married and single, do right by God. If, you, if you're cheating God, you're cheating, you, you're making it hard on your children that you hadn't had yet. If you're blessing God, you're setting it up for your family that you will have. My grandchildren, my children will be blessed because I've blessed God. Amen. Well, I, I, I can't afford it. You can't afford not to. Sh sh shave somewhere else. Trim your budget somewhere else. But well, listen, when you, when you do right by God, you're blessing your future. You're blessing your children. Parents up there in that baby section, you want to bless them babies? Tithe. Give your offerings. Now you're setting up a spiritual house for your child to be blessed. When you skim God, you cheat your children. Read it. You'll see it. You cheat your own family. Trying to outsmart God. This is why our relationship should be, and listen, we respond to everything. Let me rephrase it. Based on our relationship with the Lord. Abram said, let me tie. Now, let me move on. My time's about up. And then it says, after all this happened now, and, uh, and, and, and I'm, 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 I, listen, I hadn't, I hadn't skipped over something, but I, but I want to show you this. It says, and look at this, and then it says, and the king of Sodom said to him, all right, this is the second king, give me the persons 
and take the goods for thyself. Now, when Melchizedek, king of Salem, showed up, he showed up with a blessing in his hand. He had bread and wine. So I didn't skip it. Twofold. The bread and wine, the number one is it stood for all of the food and the nutrients and the things that one would need to live in this life. That's what it was a type for, number one. The second thing is even back then, Melchizedek, it showed that he was a type for Jesus Christ because if you study in Matthew's Gospel chapter 26 and start reading at the 26th verse, you see where Jesus took the bread and took the wine and said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. He says, now after this, this is the new, the new covenant. This is the new meal. Passover is over. This is the, the new meal is the communion. Now here is Melchizedek showing up with that way before there's a law, way before Israel goes into bondage, way before God brings them out, way before there's ever a Passover. And yet here is Melchizedek showing up with bread and wine. He had to be a type for Jesus Christ. See, he, when, when God shows up, the Bible teaches that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Lord will give you what you need in this life, and the Lord will bless you spiritually. Amen. Beloved, I, 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 I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper with. We see it in the bread and in the wine. On the other hand, the king of Sodom, Obira, he shows up just like the world, just like the world, just like the devil, just like the satanic spirits that's out today. He shows up with a spirit of entitlement. First thing he says is, give me the persons. Oh, you talking about those people you didn't take care of? You talking about the subjects, the, the people in your kingdom that you hid in the slime pits and let Catalemo take them and took them 140 miles and they were in bondage and you were just happy that you made it? And there's no scripture that teaches that you pursued Catalemo. No, you ran for your life. But not after Abram does all of the heavy lifting, wins the battle, you show up. There's no thank you, Abram. Give me the persons. That's just like the devil. And the word persons literally here means souls. And let me tell you something. This is a principle. This is the principle. This is the principle. This is what you see in some of these, uh, you see in Hollywood and these shows and stuff I was telling you about. Satan has always traded substance for souls. Notice what he says. You can have the persons, but take the goods for yourself. I'll give you, the, I'll give you substance, Ronnie Sawyer, if you give me your soul. Satan loves, say, oh, he'll offer you all kind of substance. He'll make you rich. He'll make you a movie star. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be the baddest NBA player. You went, when you went, you said you were saved. Now you're cursing, you're mad all the time. You done sold your soul. You may be MVP, but you done sold your soul. And I'll say this to anybody who sells their soul, you get the short end of the stick. Because life passes fast. And you can tell when it's time to pay the piper. You can tell, praise the Lord, when they know that death is just imminent. Oh, the career is winding down. Now it's time to pay. You're scared to go to bed at night. You, 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 you praise the Lord. You, you, want it. you have an entourage with you all the time. Going through all kinds of crazy behavior. Some of these stars that get crazy and, and just get wicked and start doing stupid stuff. Them people done sold their souls and it, and it's dawning on them. It's dawning on them that it was not a good deal. You have a garage full of cars, but with no joy in your heart. You got a house on every continent, but with no joy on, in your heart. You are as famous as can be, but you're miserable. 
you all, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. What can a man, the Bible asks, give in exchange for his soul? I'd, praise the Lord. I'd rather be right here saved. Oh, if uh, uh, saving all my love for you. Whitney Houston, oh, if she could go back and just get in a church choir. By the time the game was over, if she could just get in a church choir. It would have been a much better deal. Singing in a local church choir, working every day, been a much better deal. I don't care, because I don't care how shiny that coffin was, how beautiful it was, it doesn't matter how beautiful the funeral was, it was a funeral. And it was a coffin. And had she been saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, she'd be somewhere right now. It's a bad deal. Look at what he offered him. Substance for souls. Some of you think you didn't, well, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make it. I, I didn't make the prose. But you're a gospel preacher. I, I didn't make it. What do you mean you didn't make it? You made it. Amen. The Lord spoke to me one day, told me my football playing days over. I'm glad I listened to God. I made it. Praise the Lord. I made it. I'm glad I'm standing here saved, sanctified, and on my way to heaven. I'd rather, and I'm saved, and I got joy in my heart. And I'm saved. I got my, I got my right mind. I'm not doubting about the way. I'm not confused. When I sleep at night, I don't hear things, and I'm not afraid to put mirrors in my house. Demons don't visit me. I cast demons out. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I don't see things. Because all night and all day, an angel watching over me, my Lord. What you talking about? Don't you, don't you let the devil. Don't you, don't you sell your soul. Don't you fall for that cheap trick. It's old as time. Substance, materials for souls. I like Abram. I tell you what, I wish Snoop Dogg would have called Abram and say, hey, Hey, Jesus, or whatever you call it, whatever, whatever the language is, I want you to sing with me. I, I, want, you to, I, want, you to, I want you to do an album with me, buddy. Abram, when, 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 when he made the offer, I like what, I like what Abram did. Abram said, uh, verse 22, and Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have, not I'm going to, not I need to, but I have. It was done at some point in the past already. I have lifted my hands to the Lord, to the most high God, to the possessor of heaven and earth. In other words, I've already, I, I trust God for my, I trust God for my life. I trust God for my provisions. I've already, I've already sold out. I, I'm, I'm trusting God to make a way for me. I've, I've already picked sides. I'm going with the maker and the creator of everything. I've all, I'm already on the Lord's side. I don't need anything from you. I've already picked sides. Do I have anybody in here tonight who've already picked sides? Have anybody here tonight who've already lifted their hands? I don't care what the devil offer, what the, what the TV show offer, what Hollywood offers, bump that stuff. My God, I walk into the, walk, walk into the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, convenience stores and I see all of the lottery machines. I look at the machines and think to myself, I've already. I've already lifted my hands. So I don't, I don't need it. No, I'm not going to I'm not going to look around and see if the saints are watching and slip a dollar in there. No, I've already lifted my hands. I've already turned my life over uh, uh, to the maker of heaven and earth. I'm already trusting God for all the provision. That I'll ever need. I'm all, I've already, I'm already, I'm already too late, too late, too late, too late, too late. You ought to tell the king of Sodom, too late. Tell the son of evil, too late. My God, maybe, hey devil, you came 40. I've been in thing 40 years. Came 40 years too late. Should have showed up in 76. Maybe I would have taken you up, but in 77, I met Jesus. Too late. <laughs> I've already lifted my hands. 
He's already my shepherd. I have a blesser. That's what he's saying to him. See, I bet, he, see when you read Abram's life, Abram had been, been building altars everywhere. Everywhere he stopped, he built an altar. See, he had a relationship with God. So when, it, when the king of Sodom came, he had nothing to offer him. So you can have all this substance. Well, man, listen, I just got the bread and the wine. I mean, you got Jesus, saints. Come on now. Well, I'm just thinking about leaving the church, and I'm just thinking about going back. You know, for what? I, I can't figure it out. I just can't figure it out. I, since 1977, I, I can't figure it out. For what? I left there. One time, I had a mind. I told you I had a mind to go back, and the Lord didn't even tell me not to. The Lord said, do you know what it was like when you was out there? I said, yes. He says, nothing has changed. I said, okay. That's it. That was all he had to tell me. Because if what I left, if it's still like I left it, I, I left it. Why are you going to go back to what you left? Uh, I'm, I'm, not in the, I'm not in the habit of going backwards. I want to make every day count. So what he says to him is, I've already lifted my hands, and I like this, verse 23. That I will not take from I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latch. Woo! And that I will not take anything of that. He, I mean, he was so, so con conciliatory, so detrimental, and so humble with Melchizedek. But when the devil showed up, it wasn't no sweet, you know, well, let's talk about it. Well, maybe. Well, let me see how this will further my career. He said, no. He didn't pray about it. He didn't need to go ask God. Let me call the pastor. I would have got 50 texts. What do you think I ought to do? What? What does the Bible say? Do what God's word says. You know the Lord is God. You know what the Bible says. Don't come asking me no questions that you've already, I've already taught on it. But pastor, I need, to, I need some scriptures on transgender. What? I need some scriptures on this, that, and the other. I need some scriptures on abortion. I'm not quite sure where I stand. By now? I mean, we only talk about it every Sunday. <laughs> We, it, that's intentional. We include it some kind of way. I mean, shucks. I mean, a million babies a year being killed, so you better talk about it. And, and most churches don't, so somebody's got to do it. And so now, now, he says here, he says, oh, no, I, I don't want to stream. Boy, you, hey, you, you're talking about telling him off. I don't. See that little lint, that, that little thread that's coming out of your robe, King? That, just a thread. I don't want that. You have a latch untied on your shoe. I don't want that. I don't want anything from you because you know what? I, praise the Lord, will never, I never want to be in a place where you will be able to say, because you're the son of evil, you're the devil, you will never be able to say that you made me rich. It ought to matter. It ought to matter to the believer how you got over. It ought to matter who gets the glory for your blessing. It ought to matter how you got promoted not just that you got promoted but how you got promoted it ought to matter how you got to the top and lied your way to the top slept your way to the top uh, schemed your way to the top well, well you're not at the top you're just somebody taking up a seat. You don't have an anointing, and you'll never be able to function. And when the time is right, God's going to show you up by putting a microphone in your hand, and he'll prove then that you ain't got it. But that person who have just waited on the Lord, and when you wait on the Lord, sometimes it takes longer. When you wait on the Lord, sometimes you don't have the connections. When you wait on the Lord, sometimes it, it appears that you're being looked over, looked, amen, and, and passed over. But when the time is right, you know what Abram's chief concern was? His concern wasn't what he owned. His chief concern was who gets the credit. Now, some of us, that ain't our concern. 
We got preachers who don't care how they start a church. We'll steal your church, steal your members, call, all the time call you their spiritual father and start that church and then turn around and say that's God. They don't care who, they don't care how God looks, they just want it. See, you're not to want anything so bad that, it, that you don't care how God looks. You're not to want anything so bad that it diminishes the glory of God. If, if, if it's gonna cost me God's glory, if it's gonna make the Lord look bad for me to get this thing, I'd rather not have it. He said, uh-uh, no, sir, you are not, my name is not Lot. You, you got me confused. You must think I'm my nephew. He's got to grow. But, uh, you know, I, I, I have a relationship with God. I have one. And you'll never be able to say that you made me rich. Lottery, you'll never. Somebody ought to shout. You ought to praise the Lord. You'll never be able to say that you made me rich. You'll never be able to say that I sold drugs. That's how he got that car. That's how he did this. He stole from the church. No, sir. The Lord is my shepherd. I need about 10 people who care about giving God some glory. This is Bible study night. What Abram was doing, he was protecting the God who protected him. Now, when the Lord does something for you, you ought to protect God's reputation. It ought to matter to you how God looks. He brought you out, picked you up, turned you around. Then you're going to make a spectacle out of yourself and therefore I'm crucifying the Lord afresh. Some of us make the Lord look bad in front of the world. He's been too good to us. He's been too good to us for us to do him like that. For us to do him like that. Abram said he's been too good to me. It, it was the Lord. You, you, man, you look, you were hiding in a slime pit. I don't want your possession because what? I got to give them back to you. I went and took them. I beat Catalabar. I made him leave them. You can't give me anything because God has already given me everything. Praise the Lord. If anything, I got to, I'm, I'm going to release Lot and if he's dumb enough to go on back down there with you, <laughs> which he was. Chapter 19, we find him, you know, some people never learn. Had, had he just had sense in chapter 14, his wife wouldn't have become a pillow saw. Children wouldn't have raped him. The daughters wouldn't have married homosexuals. God had delivered him. Why you keep going back to Sodom? Every time the Lord bring you out, there you go, right back in. We ought to be so glad that the Lord brought us out of Egypt, we ought to just be through with it. Done. Brought me out of Egypt, I ain't going back. Done. Done. Thank you. Done. Done. <laughs> Man, I, went from, I went from Sodom, I went from Sodom all the way to Damascus. I just knew I was through, and God brought me out. Now, ain't no way in this world I'm going back to Sodom. He, the man went back to Sodom. But Abram said, no, sir, you'll never be able to do this to me. Uh, let you be able to say that you made, you'll never be able to say, I love this. I love the defiance. See, uh, like some of you people online, you, you are uh, social media folk. You would have thought that Abram was arrogant and self-righteous. I mean, why, 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 why is he judging the king of Sodom like that? Because the man wasn't no good. And he didn't want that man's endorsement. I can't help it because we've changed so much now that we'll take the endorsement of the wicked. Take the endorsement of the devil. Take the endorsement. Now, and every time you see Snoop Dogg, he's doing a new thing on marijuana and all that. Guy. He's got the devil in him. How in the world the devil going to come up in the church? Steve Harvey was trying to tell us what, how, that we need to let rappers come up and sing and rap and have words in the church. They can come to church and sit down, but they ain't going to run the service. No, sir. No, sir. 
Abram said, I don't, I don't care. I don't. Abram said, well, uh, you'll never be able to say, you made me rich. Some of these guys are scared, some of these pastors are scared to preach certain things because they got somebody who might go pro or may go Hollywood, and if they get a big acting job, they may get a big paycheck, and they, they give to the church. You'll never be able to say, you made me rich. I don't, I don't, want, I don't want it like that. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Don't want it that way because that doesn't give glory to the Lord. And we were put here to give glory to the Lord. You weren't put here to get rich, you were put here to give glory to the Lord. And y'all not to want to get rich if you can't get rich and give glory to the Lord as a result of it. Whatever comes your way, if you can't give glory to the Lord and do it, then y'all not to do it. If it comes at the expense of God's glory, y'all not to do it. Abraham said, you'll never be able to say that you made me rich. And then, then he said this. Now, look at this. He was considerate. He said, now, I'm, I'm done. He said, save only the man which, uh, save only that which the young men have eaten. These warriors who were with me, uh, when they conquered Catalema, they were hungry. So they ate. And, I, and I, I, I like this about him. And he says, and the portion of the men which went with me. He said, now, I'm not taking anything, but I understand that not everybody has my conviction. Not everybody believes this thing Abram said like I do. So he says right here, but, with the men, but concerning the men, the portion of the men who came up here with me, Aner and Eskol and memory, he says now, let them take their portion. So, so they, they may not feel the way I, I do about this. So maybe they may take you up on, on your offer and uh, uh, accept what you have to offer. And the story closes. And I love, love the way it closed because, <laughs> you know, Bible teaches let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And here's was, here was, here, here's, 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 here's the dramatic irony of it. We don't know how they responded to it. The scriptures doesn't say that they took him, took it. He just says, I'll leave it up to them. But I'm telling you, you'll never be able to say that you made me rich. Uh-uh. But now these other guys who fought with me, you know, you have to see them. Praise the Lord, ask them. I'm, I'm going all the way now. I'm going all the way. I like to say we're going all the way. That's what I like to say. But at the end of the day, end of the day, every man's got to speak for himself. Praise the Lord, pastors. I, I, pastor, we're going all the way. But at the end of the day, I, I understand your conviction may not be mine. It just may, it just may be mine. So now I got to let that, got to give space for you to have yours. But I got mine. And ain't no need you trying to change mine. Praise the Lord. I'm not taking this from the king of Sodom. Well, you know, you got to look at it. I don't have to look at it any way other than the way I'm looking at it. Don't come trying to change my mind. Well, just let me put it to you this way. No, put it to yourself that way. I'm going to stick with the Bible. Lady said one time in a debate, the problem with Reverend Wooden is, the problem with Dr. Wooden is, <laughs> the problem with him is he views uh, the human race uh, only from a male-female perspective. That's his problem. I said, yeah. We got to, you, you sure got that right because the Bible said God made them male and he made them female. Now what other perspective is there to view? From? Every one of us in our lives will meet over and over and over two kings. Both kings will come bearing gifts. Both you can't take both of them's offer. Abram couldn't be a worshiper of the Most High God and take the offer of Bera. And he certainly couldn't take Bera's offer and also take the offer of Melchizedek. You have to choose. 
If I be a man of God, that's why the shut-in is so important. The shut-in gives us the spiritual tools to judge rightly. Father, we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you, Lord. And we ask your God to keep us and bless us and cause your face to ever shine upon us. Give us strength, Lord, to be able to discern the difference between Bera and Melchizedek, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. Oh, God, give us the, the wisdom to, to discern the difference. And then, God, give us to go with you. Hallelujah. Lord, as you have protected us, you protected us from Catalamor. You protected us in battle. Well, Lord, we want to protect you. We want to protect your name. We want to protect your reputation. We don't want our good to be evil spoken of. We want to shun the very appearance of evil in the name of Jesus. We want to we want to we want to bring glory to the one who has brought so much glory to us. We want to bring victory to the name of the one who has brought so much victory to us. Oh God, you've been good to us. God now anoint us to be good to you. Anoint us to be fierce protectors of your reputation. May we always be Conscious of how we look to others so that we will reflect you rightly. Hallelujah. So that they will have nothing to accuse us of, to attack you with because of us. God, make Abrams of us all. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hallelujah.